from NREL as well, and also one of the organizers. Thank you. slides in my presentation, like most people, and I thought it was 45 minutes, and then now I discover it's only 35 minutes, so I'm going to be slide hopping, uh, which I apologise because it's, it's not very comforting. Um, this is, as I said this morning, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab is the only laboratory of the US Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, and here it is. This is most of it. Um, sits on a mesa in Golden, Colorado. If you've ever been skiing in Colorado and driven from the airport, it's the last thing you see before, on the right hand side before you went to the mountains. Um, I had a joint appointment with the uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, which is a new adventure for me back from my university days. And hopefully, it will enable us to get a lot more students in, into our lab because we don't actually have enough. I'm going to acknowledge some of the people that help me to uh, get more science done than I would otherwise be able to, so I don't get to go to that very often. These are the people. Uh, Nikos, you may uh, get to see him later this year. He'll be visiting uh, Brisbane to U of Q with all the balls, uh, all three of them or four of them, however many. They call everyone Paul in that group just to keep things clear. Uh, Nikos, Nikos was going to give a presentation, but uh, uh, he couldn't come, so uh, he's, a, he's a good guy if you, when he turns up later this year to talk about microwave conductivity, which is going to be the basis of my presentation. And these are, these are the, the group. Uh, this guy just had a paper accepted 17 minutes ago. <laughs> he, do, he doesn't know because he put my name on it and I got the acknowledgement. So uh, I was going to put some of that work into the presentation, but I won't, quite simply because an hour, 45 minutes, 35 minutes, and two minutes slides, so that, that's been cut. Okay, now one of the strange things about me is, even though uh, I'm in this laboratory, I actually am funded by the US Department of Energy Office of Basic Energy Sciences. That gives me a permit to not be restricted to working on, uh, essentially, devices. They quite specifically tell me, you will not work on devices. I'm not allowed to write papers where I acknowledge that they have funded me to make a device. It's very, very strange. I have to work on fundamentals. And one of the things about this presentation is that I have removed uh, any device data, because I didn't cheat on the occasion, I didn't make them. Um, this presentation is going to be all about looking at charge carriers in the materials that we're interested in without using electrodes. This is an outline of the presentation. So we're going to get away from band diagrams, and I'm going to introduce you to state diagrams. Some people would say that's moving away from physics and going towards chemistry. If that's the case, then so be it. But we're going to introduce state diagrams into our understanding. It helps us when we do kinetics to think of state diagrams. Uh, I'm going to show you a few techniques uh, that can be used to detect carriers in a device environment without actually having the electrodes there. So, uh, as I said, I'm going to go through that fairly quickly. My technique will be the third thing I discuss, which is transient microwave conductivity. And I'll try and explain it to you in a way that makes, makes it sound appealing. Okay. Uh, it's, it's actually quite a nice, simple technique. And then, as you can see, I've got a list of things that, that, that when I was putting this, this slide together, I clearly was very, very anxious <coughs> to tell you about all these wonderful things. But I, we'll cut it down. Um, We'll have to talk about P3HT PCBM because everyone does that. Did anyone go to the P PCC11 conference last in Cairns? Anyone hear me say, if you catch me talking about P3HT PCBM, <laughs> <laughs> then you have my permission to shoot me? Did you remember that? <laughs> yes, I've got to. Until at the end of this year, I have to cease talking about it, at least in front of the people that were in Cairns. Um, so that's what I'll start off by talking about. What I'm going to actually do is not show you any data. Uh, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to show you the conclusions of that study. And then I'm going to show you how we've used those conclusions to understand some more complex systems. I'll talk about the Dendrobal one, because we've got Dendrobal people in the audience. Um, I'll 
briefly mention the nanotube beta HT system, and since this is very, very topical, uh, I'll talk about this polymer PC. BM, BCBM 71 or 70 uh, system. This is the paper that was accepted 19 minutes ago. Okay. So let's get, let's get on with this. I'm going to have to move over here to remind myself what the next slide was. Here's the, here's the device structure, and let's try and understand from a simple cartoon what we think is actually going on. Well, you saw the photon coming in, and we generated the next time. And as has been discussed already, the primary excitation in an organic solar cell is an exciton, not an electron hole pair as in a conventional semiconductor. So this exciton has to move to this interface, this critical interface, where it will be dissociated, just like that. Okay. Now that's a strange entity because that is a, uh, if those, that electron and hole are right at that interface, it will probably be this, this charge transfer state. We've seen a couple of presentations where people mention this charge transfer state, but they haven't quite separated the coupling between the electron and the hole. So technically it's still an exciton, but it's at the interface. And that's, that's a strange thing because at this point in time, you don't know whether they're coming to that point to recombine or whether they've just been generated at the interface, just by looking at that. The question you should ask yourself is why is an electron in PCBM sitting very, very close to a hole in polythiophene not recombine? Why does it do something very, very different and move away and give us current in the device? And one of the current models is suggesting this, that you don't actually produce that, you produce that. Namely, the electron and hole are produced at the interface and then move away from the interface, but they are actually moved away during the dissociation process. Remember, Sean said in his presentation, we have an energy gap here between uh, the LUMO, I hate the language, but I'll use his language, the LUMO level of the donor and the LUMO level of the acceptor, there has to be about a volt, maybe half a volt, half an electron volt, in order to drive this process. Anything less than that it seems to turn on, turn off. And anything more than that's a waste. So the question is, is that excess energy used to generate this separation? So almost certainly the primary product of this dissociation is separated electron hole pairs, not a band uh, state at the interface. It jumps over it. And then, of course, what happens in the device is they do this, they move away from each other. Now, uh, if you have no electrodes, then what you'd like to do, be able to do, is this. There too many slides, and now I'm going to repeat one. Okay, oh, you won't have this. Okay. So let's use optical spectroscopies or some other form of spectroscopies to look at these carriers and get rid of, get rid of the electrodes altogether. And that's really what this presentation is all about. And I'm sorry, now we're going to have to watch the AMA. Here's a diagram uh, I hate um, because it's very, very misleading. This is, this is the type 2 band offset diagram that we use over and over again to try and describe what's going on in a bulk heterojunction or a plain material, a donor acceptor system. And the reason I dislike it so much is because if this were not PCBM, if, if I gave you another material, this diagram would imply that it would work just as well. And it doesn't. You can't just replace. PCBM with any material that looks like that. Perylenes, for example, perylene molecules aren't a million miles away from PCBM in their position of their LUMO or their, their magnitude of their electron affinity, but they don't work as well. Right? PCBM works, perylenes are really, really mediocre. Right? So this diagram is misleading because it hasn't predicted that. This is the diagram, this next one when I press the button, is the diagram you should be looking at. This is the, this alpha term, which uh, is the value that Sean was talking about. You see there's a big difference here between 1 and 0.6 electron volts is ideal, even less than that, it's not going to work. And here's the open circuit voltage that he was talking about as well. So it's going to appear on a state diagram now, they're over here. This is a very, very complex, it's not a complex slide, it's just a redrawing of the situation. It acknowledges that when you excite the system, you don't <coughs> excite an electron from the HOMO into the LUMO. What you actually do is generate an excited state on the molecule, which has a spin characteristic that can be singlet or it can be triplet. Okay? Where on the other diagram would you have drawn a triplet state? Where on the other diagram would you have introduced the state that exists at the interface? This is, comes, I use the terminology here, band radical pair. 
It comes from James Durant at Imperial College. That's the charge transfer state of the interface. Why do we have so many languages that you have described exactly the same thing? It's a complete mystery to them. James comes from a photosynthesis background, and people who work in photosynthesis refer to band radical pairs. We call it the burp study. Okay. So in, in, if we rethink about how this is going to work uh, using a state diagram, we generate an exciton in our polymer. Here it is. This is the optical band gap. Look at that. It matches exactly where I've drawn the blue line. Don't have to modify the picture. That exciton then interacts with the, the uh, fullerene, which is here. It's the single exciton of the fullerene, a little bit less. Okay. They interact, and the argument is that they jump straight over into the free carrot state. They, inter they miss this, and they hop. This is the way of thinking about it. And that excess energy that you've lost is what generates this hopping mechanism. If this is brought down too far, you lose that hopping process, you go into here, and you recombine. It's a very, very simple model, but it is just that. It's a model. Let's not get trapped into thinking that everything in the literature is cast in iron, and we can assume that it's absolutely correct. There's lots of flaws in what we've been thinking for many, many years. Sean mentioned something earlier on, and I'll repeat it in a moment. Um, the position of this state here is critical. If it's, if it's too high, it doesn't work. If it's too low, it doesn't work. It has to be somewhere in the middle of here. And this paper here by Rena Janssen, this is an excellent paper. Uh, write down that reference, go and get it. It is a collection of lots and lots of data. And one of the conclusions that he draws from that piece of work is the maximum efficiency you will ever get from a single junction bulk heterojunction device, regardless of what the donor and acceptor are, is 11%. Interestingly, that's exactly where the dye cells start, 11%. And the 15% prediction that Maritz made, where is he on? He's here somewhere. Oh, there you go. He made it earlier was a slight cheat on Sean's part because I think that's a tandem prediction. It's a single junction prediction. He goes through the theory at some point. He goes through the theory. So he's going to say 15%, right? So Rene threw down the gauntlet and said 11%. And he's got 15%. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right. I prefer his number. Okay. And in this in this process, what you can understand is that the, the key components are getting through this point here. Excitons into free carriers and get them out from the electrodes. The problem is, is that you have competing processes. Those free carriers can come back to the interface where I guess they'll form this band radical pair or charge transfer state and then possibly recombine. That's the only recombination pathway they have is to go back to that interface and recombine. Of course they don't do it very efficiently because if they did it very efficiently these devices would not work. Would they? If we, as, as Paul said, these are kinetically controlled cells and so if you open up a pathway that is faster for recombination as opposed to extraction you don't get a device. Okay. Photosynthesis does the same thing. It separates the electron and hole and turns off the recombination process. So this is really a logical place to do all of our studies. And of course, that's what I do. I call this running the charge transfer state gauntlet. So one of the arguments I put forward is that there's a group of chemists who love making donor acceptor systems, cope like making donor acceptor systems. They're very keen on making their acceptor systems. And Whenever they want to test it out, the only way they really have to do it at the moment is to make a device. The device does not work. Was their acceptor no good? Or was it that it was perfect and did exactly what the fullerene did, but they were unable to make a device to extract the carriers? So I argue that the best thing to do is look at this intervening window, run, run through here, but have a look at these carriers being produced in a simple way without actually having to make a device. Hence, the, the driving force for looking at the carriers without having to make, put electrodes on it and make a device. Now here are some techniques that can be looked, you can use to look for excitons or charged carriers. You can't look at everything with uh, these, tech, these approaches. PL is very, very good at looking for excitons, not very good for looking at charged carriers. Sean showed you some picosecond or femtosecond transient absorption spectroscopy, uh, looking at the carriers, uh, and I'll mention that a bit in a moment. Uh, transient terahertz spectroscopy is very similar, 
except that instead of using visible or infrared light to probe the presence of the carriers, you use terahertz frequencies. Uh, the best one of the lot is this one here, which is bold and metallic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what I'm hoping to convince you is, um, whilst it's not perfect, it really is a good starting place. It's really very, very nice to be able to say, do I have carriers, yes or no? Of course, the question is, always becomes more complicated when you ask the question, how many carriers, but we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, we have uh, ODMR, you know, Joe Chenard, who's going to be giving a talk this week, that may or may not have that in, in, the, uh, in the presentation, so I'm not going to talk about it, which is kind of convenient, because the last thing we need is three more slides in this talk. Uh, and another technique, which this is a very, very good technique, low time resolution, but good chemical sensitivity, telling you where carriers might exist. Uh, EPR and Vladimir Diakonov is here this week and he's done some great work and I hope that he's going to have some of that in his presentation. So my focus is going to be on this approach here. But let's first go through some of the, uh, the work that's been done using transient absorption or transient terahertz. This is uh, a paper from uh, Bali Bardini showing where things might absorb. He, you see, he's, he's, okay, one of his papers has uh, state uh, band diagrams, uh, and then when he wanted to talk about single excitons and triplet excitons, he flipped over, flipped over and talked about something else, different state model rather than a band model. But he introduces two concepts which um, I don't think I still fully understand. Uh, he talks about polarons and delocalized polarons. Polarons, delocalized polarons, cations, anions, free carriers, mobile carriers. How many words do we need to describe these charges? And one of the things we have to be careful of, we don't think they're all different because they have different names. Well, I will in a conversation use words randomly just to make it confusing. Not only that, it covers up how ignorant you are. If you say to someone, oh yeah, I think it's a cation or a polaron, they think you're really clever. <laughs> so you have to, just don't, don't muddle things up. It's, it's, it's difficult enough as it is already. So a cation and a polaron aren't necessarily the same thing, I don't think they are. So what's the difference between a polaron and a delocalized polaron? Well, according to Valley Bardini, the localized polaron sits on uh, a chain, a disordered chain, and it's localized. And the delocalized polaron is delocalized over ordered chains. So which one of those is the mobile one? I mean, you think it's the delocalized polaron. Okay, I'm going to show you. So the polaron is the trapped one, the delocalized polaron is the mobile one. Neither of them are cations as far as I can tell, or anions. So this technique, transient terahertz spectroscopy, close relative and microwave conductivity, uh, can actually probe which one's trapped and which one's mobile. So terahertz will only uh, give you a signal and absorption, there will only be an interaction if the charge moves. If you can make it wobble, basically. You can get a resonance with the terahertz frequency. So this technique technically should only see the delocalized polarons. It should not see the polarons, if they're trapped, and certainly would never see a cation or an anion. And you can see how complicated it is. Uh, let's just move on. Um, let me just say the one thing that's good about transient terahertz spectroscopy, it has very, very good time resolution. You get uh, time resolution of the order of sub picoseconds down in the femtosecond domain. It's very, very good. It is a complex experiment, you can see here. This is a very, very non trivial experiment. Uh, we have one of the best people in the world at NRL for doing this experiment, he did his PhD on it, and it's still a very, very hard experiment. And you need a lot of light in order to see get enough carriers in order to see them absorbed by the terahertz frequency. That is not always a good thing. I don't know what's next. That's some data. <clears throat> Transient terahertz spectroscopy looking at a PCBM P3HT blend. Here's a, a little pitfall I want you to, to take notice of, because this is a paper that, that Matt Beard, who's the expert, was talking about a moment ago, and I'm on there as well. I'd like to say I was scientifically involved. I was, I was. It was a time ago, 2006, when I was just a kid. So if you look at P3HT film, just this one here, here's the absorption of the terahertz. This, so this is, shall we say, looking at mobile carriers detected by one terahertz radiation. One, 
Yes, Montero is hard on your side. It's a 50-50 blend. It's like factor of two different. And that isn't that surprising. So you look on an ultra-fast time scale, and the ultra-fast time scale says you put 50% PCBM in your system and your signal goes up by a factor of two. That seems a bit small, okay? Because we know that devices produce many, many more carriers. Lots of people will tell you that there are no carriers that are used in P3HT at all, only excitons. That's wrong. But the problem is, is that the carriers are being produced over long time scales. And you have to look at this tail here to see that the carriers are being produced after the exciton, after the light pulse was, was used to generate. They live for very, very long times. Here's James Durant's work. James goes out into the microseconds, milliseconds, and he sees these carriers being produced way, way out. Now, if you go to these papers, look where he, where he uh, detects his carriers. 980 nanometers. Go back to that earlier slide, we're not going to do it, you have no time to go back to old slides, and you'll find that that polaron absorption is the polaron absorption that was trapped and localized on a single chain, according to Barry Vardini. Okay, so if they're trapped on the, ch the chain, are they the ones that are getting out of the electrodes? That's what James is saying, that this polaron absorption here, this long decay of the signal, this is a power law decay, the log log plot, everything's linear on a log log plot. <laughs> uh, you, have to, you have to be very, very careful because he's probing the species of 980 nanometers, which he said is the charge carrier, but it's the polar absorption. The Valley Bardini is saying that that's not a delocalized part of polar. Sorry, it's not a delocalized charge, it's not mobile. So we have to be, we have to be a little bit careful. So here's my experiment. Uh, the, the, I want to show you photographs of it because it's very, very old equipment uh, and uh, doesn't look very impressive. But the nice thing about this approach is, uh, is the following. First thing is, is that relative to terahertz spectroscopy, it's much, much slower. It's only a nanosecond technique, not a big second technique. <clears throat> but I've already shown you that if you do a fast experiment, you get misled because you don't see the carriers you'd expect. This is slow. It's, it's timed to get those carriers. And we get good sensitivity because we have our sample in a resonant microwave cavity. So basically it's doing the same thing as the terahertz using 10 gigahertz radiation and not terahertz radiation. And it, it's, it's very sensitive because it's got a resonance cavity. It's also very sensitive to some other little tricks that uh, I'd like to tell you about, but I don't know what they are because my system was built in Delft and they won't tell me what the little tricks are. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows. It's a little bit of a fine art here of working with microwaves. So the nice thing about this technique is you can probe the real and the imaginary part of the dielectric constant of the sample. And it's the imaginary part of the dielectric constant that turns into photoconductivity. And it's photoconductivity that's giving you the signal from three carriers. Right? So this is where we'd like to work. We'd like to see absorption by our free carriers, our mobile carriers, free, mobile, and at 10 gigahertz. And you have to remember they all go together. This isn't the mobility that you'd measure in a time of flight experiment. And I was going to tell you, show you some data showing how we can see not just a change in absorption, but a change in the real part of the dielectric constant, the imaginary part of the photoconductivity. And that's when we can actually see excitons as well. And until about a month ago, I'd never seen them, but now we're seeing them. It's a bit of a shock. And my group are a little bit worried because we had a technique that we thought was only sensitive to charges being produced, and now we are starting to see excitons. But trust me, I'll put a good spin on it. <laughs> okay, so this is how it works. We take our device and take the electrodes off, put it on its side, measure the microwave power from the sample, excite, measure the power again, and you get a nice complex equation. Okay? So I said you only see three carriers. What you actually see is Four possibilities in terms of carriers. You can see uh, electrons produced in the polymer, in the donor polymer, holes in the donor polymer, and the same thing for electrons in the receptor. And you'll say, well, why are you muddling this up, Gary? I don't need to worry about all these terms. I only need to worry about holes in the polymer and electrons in the receptor. And I'm going to show you some data in a moment uh, that proves that to be an incorrect statement. This is the equation we'd like to see. It's nice and simple. Just number of holes we produce in the donor polymer. The decay is a function of time. 
This is the mobility. <clears throat> I pretend that this technique is very general where you can pick up carriers in the material very easily. But it, it really, we have the same problem as the optical spectroscopists. They don't know what the extinction coefficient of the absorption is for all their carriers. What is the extinction coefficient for an electron in PCBM? What is the extinction coefficient from a hole in a new dendron? We don't know what that is, and we don't know where it absorbs. And I pretend that my technique can get around that. In fact, it can't. So we really need to know these mobilities. And that's one of the difficulties we have. However, we move on. Okay? If it was that hard, I wouldn't be continuing the presentation. Here's a nice thing about the technique. It works from the width of the laser pulse, nanoseconds, microseconds, and just like James Durant's experiment, it goes on and on and on out in time for as long as the carriers are out there and have a mobility in the 10 gigahertz range. This is the window that is very often left out. Ultra-fast people are looking here, and they're going to miss things because the carriers haven't been produced. And these are the carriers that, that people were worried about because they're the ones harvested by electrodes when you make a device. I sit between the two. That means I have no one to argue with, but it's, it's okay. Okay, so we have three. I work on three dome, time domains uh, in, in understanding the data. There's the early time domain, uh, where the pulse is um, basically within the laser pulse. That tells me how many carriers I get produced to start my experiment. And then we have how hey, they, they decay over the first 200 nanoseconds. Very interesting. Paul is eluded. I'm a kineticist. I like doing kinetics. And then we have the long time domain, which is where we overlap with James Duran. That's where Nikos Kopidakis comes in. That's where we talk to the device people, because these are the carriers harvested by electrodes. Okay? So that's where it all ties together. And one of the things that uh, you should note is that when you're doing a an experiment of this type, you have no electrodes, you're effectively looking at open circuit voltage conditions. Okay? Which means it's the worst case scenario. You, your carriers can do nothing but recombine. That's why the signal lives so long. You've taken the electrodes away, so there's nowhere for them to go, so the only thing they can do is recombine. Here's some data for um, P3HT, PCBM, to show you what real transients look like. I was going to talk a long time about that, but I won't. Uh, I was equally going to talk a long time about how we model these transients using um, nice complex functions. This is a purely empirical function that had, hangs on to a kinetic model by its fingertips. Okay? So I'm a person that believes that you have a kinetic scheme to describe what's going on, and you solve that kinetic scheme, and if you can't, you do it numerically. This is neither. But as you can see, we can get good fits to our data. We can model all these transients with this simple function. And we remove the instrument response function of our, of our system. And most of this decay here is the decay of the microwave cavity. It's about 10 nanoseconds. Okay? If we make that much, much less, we lose our sensitivity. If we make it much, much longer, our sensitivity goes up, but we lose our time resolution. So that's all we're going to take away from that. Okay? I'm going to jump. Next slide. Let's go to this one. Okay, I told you that you often get carriers produced in a neat system. And here are four examples. Um, just a series of polythiophenes. Uh, these are uh, this one and this one are from Plextronics. Uh, they're called Pantane and McSherry. I can never remember which one it is, but they're two polymers. You can see they look very, very similar. The transit profiles look very, very similar to P3HT. So we're getting carriers in P3HT without any acceptor. The yield is about 3%. Increase the photon energy to say 400 nanometers instead of 600, that goes up to 8 or 9%. No acceptor. It's a really nifty idea. We should work on that a bit more. So let's excite uh, uh, a dendroma. You see the signal is very noisy. That tells you that, that there are not many carriers produced in a neat film of a dendroma. What happens if you go to the acceptors? Single wall carbon nanotubes, um, you see the signal goes up and straight back down. That's the instrument response function of my system. Okay, all the carriers are produced, and then either recombine or do something to lose the carriers very, very quickly. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And um, I was going to talk about some nanoparticle work. You can see, you can see a signal in neat uh, nanoparticles where there are a dot, a rod, or a tetrapod. 
And at this moment, I don't know the origin of that signal. In theory, I should not be able to see anything. Because one of the features of, of uh, carriers combined to a nanoparticle is if you confine the carriers too much, you lose their mobility. You start to make them resonate, and they bang into the ends of the, of the, of the particle. And so you lose your mobility. Okay? Just quite a simple model that uh, here, you can see we're picking up a signal. We don't fully understand where it comes from. So here is an analysis. Uh, this is uh, here's some work I did earlier. I'm not going to tell you how I got to this point. I said I solved kinetic schemes numerically, and we now understand how to model the kinetics of P3HT PCBM. Yeah. One of the things that we've discovered, and this is a big surprise to me, it took me three years to accept this, but we can actually see electrons in PCBM clusters. And you'd say, well, that's obvious, Gary. Surely you should have seen that. But if you put an electron in a PCBM, it's going to rattle around and hit the side. So you shouldn't be able to see an electron in an isolated PCBM, and you don't. But if you put another one next to it, if, the, if you see the electron move from one PCBM to another, that means the coupling must be very, very strong. And so one of the things that, that was for hard for me to understand, right? If you put electrodes on, you know this happens, so why the microwaves would be different? I just thought it was going to be. And there's some confusing data in the literature that, that reinforced my, my, uh, my bad knowledge. So one of the things is when you have PCBM in the system, most of the signal actually comes from electrons. Okay, this, is the, this signal I'm modeling here is the raw data, is the electron signal. I can separate them. Isn't it annoying when someone shows you some, something so nice that they're not going to explain it, but we have to move on. Okay, so I see just basically electrons in PCBM, and this little bit on the top of it is the holes in the polymer. And that's a key finding for us. Because what it means is, is that I can now detect clustering of PCBM. If I don't have clusters of PCBM, I get no electron signal, and I only see holes, just in the case of deep polymer. If I have clusters of PCBM, I get a signal dominated by the electrons, because the electron mobility is high, and we have a high number of the carriers. So let's see how far we can push that piece of information. Okay. Uh, this is a conclusion slide, which we, we, oh, I'm going to jump over. There's a number of conclusions there. Here is uh, some work we did with Gendrimus, and this is an ecosystem's work. Uh, and what we discovered is that everything looks good with the dendrimus. They have the same repeat units, they absorb it roughly the same place, everything's going to be wonderful and then devices don't work, and when you look at the microwave conductivity signal, it disappears very, very quickly. Why is that doing that? Because when you dissolve the PCBM in the polymer, you get this strong interaction between the dendroma and the PCBM, so you don't get any clusters. Right? So if you don't get any clusters, you get a signal that looks just like the holes in the, in the dendroma, and the device doesn't work because you don't have any clusters because they're all being packed with the dendroma. So you can see the microwave conductivity data is agreeing with the device data. No PCBM clusters, no electron signal. I should add, it's only six months ago that I learned this. Maybe it was ten months ago. Here is uh, what happens if you put differing amounts of PCBM into a dendroma. Don't worry about the name. And the same data for PCBM P3HT. And this is the signal at t equals zero. So what this shows us, as we add PCBM with P3HT, in the system, the signal jumps up and then plateaus off. And that's because the signal goes up because we're detecting the electrons. And in the, the, the PCBM dendroma case, it doesn't, so the signal just creeps up. And this is basically the yield of carriers going up as you let the PCBM. It doesn't work as a device. Here's a polymer that uh, some of you may, have not heard, may or may not have heard of, uh, PB triple T. Um, it's a uh, polymer that came from Ian McCulloch and Martin Heaney, Imperial College, and Mike McGee, he has done some great work on understanding what happens when you dissolve C60 PCBM or the 70, C70 version of it. It intercalates between side chains. So the question is, do we see the electrons pop between the PCBMs in the side chains, or are they decoupled enough? And the answer is, they're too decoupled. We hope that the next slide is going to be... Yeah, 
So what actually happens there is you put in PCBM and it intercalates. So all you get is a signal that goes up a little bit. And you add more PCBM and that also intercalates. So the signal goes up a little bit more. And at some point you saturate the number of PCBMs that can intercalate and it starts to cluster. All of a sudden the signal jumps up because you're now seeing the electrons. And so if you have a ratio, mole ratio less than 60%, you won't get a good device because you don't have clustered C PCBM, whether it's 60 or 70. Go over that point, it jumps up. You know, so any HPPV PCBM devices require a 4 to 1 ratio. P3HT PCBM only needs 1 to 1. So which is the best one to use? Do you need a lot of PCBM? Or do you need to stick to a 50-50 ratio? So it's an it's a, it's a interesting point. That we, you need the PCBMs to cluster very quickly, and they do so in P3HT. Two more slides. This is a, a we do degradation studies of NREL, the device people. Unfortunately, that's where they get most of their money from these days. But here is some microwave conductivity data for material systems that have been uh, prepared as a witness to the device. So the two systems were prepared, one was a device, one was just the material. And so here is a signal from this blend when it was first made. And as you irradiate the sample, we know the devices get worse and worse and worse. And you see the microwave conductivity transients drop off. And right after about a thousand hours, they look very, very similar to the PC, to the polydiaphragm. Why is that? Well, I'm going to tell you it's because the PCBMs aren't clustered. So why does irradiation over long periods of time cause the declustering? And the answer is, oxygen is added onto the PCBM. Now hands up, who would have predicted that the main degradation mechanism for P3HT PCBM <laughs> is not the polymer, but the PCBM? <laughs> <laughs> It protects the polymer. It, does. it protects the polymer. <laughs> well, ah, uh, okay. okay. We've, entered, we've entered question time, Mr. Chair. <laughs> it does protect the polymer, it, absolutely. But the, the assumption was that it protected the polymer by harvesting the excitons. Yeah? But here, what it's actually doing, it's sacrificial as well. Okay? It's, it's given up its life to get the oxygen. Now, the surprising thing to me was. And this is what I'm showing you here, because all I did is throw this up and say it's the PCBM. What I'm showing you here is it's a Molditoff uh, set of data for the, the material after it's been irradiated. Here's the, here's the original PCBM, with one oxygen, two oxygen, three, four, five. It, it keeps adding singular oxygens. Now, my first guess to this was that What's happening is you're getting triplet states, you're sensitizing oxygen in the system, you've got single oxygen that is attacking the PCBM, but I would have predicted you put them on in twos, not singular. So, I digress, because someone enabled me to digress. Uh, but we learnt about, we, we were concerned about the PCBM, we did the molded on because something was happening to the PCBM it was being oxidized in the true sense of the word, chemically oxidized. And we picked that up using the microwave conductivity experiment. Okay, that wasn't the last slide. Um, I want to convince you that nanotubes can replace PCBM. <coughs> Is that data I showed you when we excited the nanotube on its own, carries produced and lost. We don't understand that. You should produce excitons in nanotubes as well. So where did the signal come? You, if you put, it, you put the nanotubes in a blend of the polymer, you can see we get all the transients again. This is kind of nice. These transients you see here are now the electrons in the carbon nanotube, which is perfect. Okay. In fact, we even see the electrons banging off the end of the nanotubes, even if they're a micron long, which is rather nice. But this shows that the carbon nanotube can act as an acceptor. And it's always assumed that it will do that, Rarely is it shown. So here are some take home messages. So, electrodeless spectroscopic detection of carriers is an excellent tool. Uh, it's an excellent tool for looking at that fundamental step, that early stage in the process. Chemists, you should love this. Okay? It means you can carry on doing your work and you don't have to make devices. 
Right? I think that's really, really valuable. Yeah. You should think state diagrams and not band diagrams. This isn't going to help you. This is complex, but it's more revealing. Um, many conjugated polymers produce carriers directly without having an acceptor there. Why is that? Sean told us we had to throw away one volt of energy when we had an acceptor there. Not if you can do it with just the meat polymer. We're back to the old semiconductor days. The shot the quasar limit that Sean put, put up for a, an extra binding energy of zero, right? We're getting closer to that. We can get a, we can get a limit of 30% on our devices and we don't have to play around with acceptors. This he alluded to, and I have not, but polythiophene has a huge number density of carriers in the dark. 10 to the 16 carriers per cc in the dark. That's why he had it in his slide. He got away. No one said to him, Sean, where do those carriers come from? Why do you talk about them? Very, very important. It modifies the field of the device. Why are those carriers there? How do they get there? Are they good? Are they bad? We don't know the answer to that. Polythiophene is the worst case we've come across. Um, I, and the rest of it. And of course, you, you know that microwave conductivity is a good technique. Now, I'm going to leave this slide up because you should be thankful I didn't put this one up to begin with because I spent about 20 minutes on this one slide. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention and I will take any questions. Well, thanks for a um, really interesting subject. I'd like to abuse the chair for a second and make a comment to start with. Um, that I was really excited to be using about state diagrams and not band diagrams because I think as all the students in code will tell you, I've been bagging on about this for, for ages in our meetings and getting very cross at anyone who says they don't know a particularly when they're talking about a measurement, because really, you know, there's, there's a very basic theory kind of approximation, yeah. and the S1 and the T1, so on, are really what you're measuring. Yes. There's, there's, you know, I'm very glad when you come from a very different perspective than me as many body theorists, um, saying you know, basically exactly what you say. That was unplanned. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so now that some, some other people get a word in the Cool. Harry, you, you know, you know, Mr. Swig's evidence there that um, that's the most common communicator is you get an increase in the carry density of this game. So, presumably, um, one would see the same trend if you deliberately um, force the system, say, thermal annealed the system through to, to deliberately force clustering. Is that the case? Yes. Yes, that, that is the case. Um, I'm just trying to think if I have any data that, that can, can verify that. Um, I, can't, I don't have any data to, to... I have lots of bits of data that, that may be related to the annealing concept we've done this. I think we have, I think we have it. Uh, Alex Nardis, I believe, has done it. You can see the signal change as you as you force the, force the clustering. I think the more exciting thing about it is not the annealing step, because we all anneal, okay? You know, very few people make a device and then not anneal the sample. So it's a natural thing to do. But um, some polymers don't work. If you take Regio uh, random polythiophene, PCB air needs to go in high concentration before it starts to cluster. I mean, HPPV, you need more PCB air before it clusters. Comparison to the 10 per second or the nanosecond spectroscopy, typically what is the excitation intensity or carrier concentration and how much is your microwave exciting the, the carrier density? So how much moves away from equilibrium when you do the experiment? Oh, okay. um, so you're talking about the intensity of the probing light? As well as, as open well, the Well, if you imagine the, the microwave power is less than a milliwatt. Really, really low, low power, uh, and it, it only perturbs the system very, very slightly. A more um, an area where you need to be more careful is the pump laser fluence that you use to generate your excitons, which then give you your carriers. And when you go down the experiments, the, the faster it is, the more light you use. And one of the variables I didn't show you, or I didn't point out in a lot of detail, was to, we change our light intensity. Uh, as, as a variable, and the transients change shape. We know why, we can model it. But it means that the transients that the 
the ultra fast people in this and work in a domain where the kinetics, you've seen all these second order effects, where you're pumping the hell out of the system. We, uh, our lowest light level is just above solar intensity. But the, the probing wavelengths aren't part of the problem. Okay. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Where the transient spectroscopy and the uh, transient microwave, uh, which is better in terms of time of uh, uh, time resolution? Time resolution. Okay. Oh, the, the transient terahertz. Okay. Transient terahertz has much, much better time That's resolution. Like, uh, hundreds, ten times. Uh, you, uh, Yes, in the transit terahertz experiment, you generate that the production of terahertz is, is a nonlinear process. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, you can talk to Chris Barbie and we'll tell you all about nonlinear effects. Uh, but in order to get the intensities uh, to get the terahertz, uh, you, need, you need high power lasers, you need femtosecond lasers. And it's the same femtosecond laser that you use to produce the terahertz that you also excite the sample with. Uh, the, that doesn't really say that you should use a lot of light. Basically, you don't have uh, a lot of sensitivity with a single pass of the terahertz radiation through your sample. So the different, another difference between the two, the reason they had this good time resolution is because it's just a single pass. You just see the change in transmission of one terahertz of radiation, and you can imagine that through a you know, 200 nanometer polymer film. Whereas the microwave experiment, um, we we're effectively multi-pass. So we, even though we have the same sample, the same 200 nanometers, we, we effectively multiply by putting in the cavity, but we lose our time resolution. So what do you want, sensitivity or time resolution? Well, that's obviously what you need. Sensitivity. Okay. That's what you, actually, that's very important. You do need the sensitivity. And the reason that uh, this is hard is because in both in terahertz and in microwave, the sensitivity is limited by the mobility of the carriers, how easy they move in the respective windows that we look, terahertz or 10 gigahertz in microwaves. And we all know that the mobility of carriers in organics is very low. You go to a physics department and say, do you have a system for measuring carrier recombination in, in semiconductors? And they'll say, yeah, we've got four of them. They're, they're here and here and here. It's dead easy. Uh, and they'll say, this is a microwave absorption technique. Okay? Don't go and say to them, can you look at this organic? Right? <laughs> oh, don't do it. Yeah, do it. We don't waste more than a day on this. But they can't see it because the order of the, the mobility order of magnitude is down by about six orders of magnitude. So this is why you need the sensitivity because of the low mobilities of the organics versus conventional semiconductors. By the way, can I make the terahertz spectrometer by itself or is it So can I make by itself the terahertz spectrometer? I didn't. No, I'm not that stupid. Uh, <laughs> it's a really hard experiment. Matt Beard did his PhD with Charlie Schmutzmeyer, who was the person that started up. Is that right, Chris? Yes, Charlie Schmutzmeyer was the first person to do time resolved uh, terahertz spectroscopy. And the graduate student who did that work was Matt Beard. And that's who we have at Emma. Um, and we had the system built in the lab for a year with some poor graduate student with big tufts of hair missing. Uh, who required Matt to come in and spend another three months with him to make it work. Really not a very simple experiment to do. You don't just have a terahertz detector on the end. It's the detection of the frequencies is, is as hard as creating them. That's not... Uh, and at the, the end of the day, you still haven't done the experiment that you, you plan to do in the beginning. Very, very hard. Okay, just a quick follow-up on the sensitivity. How low can you go in the concentration of things like the nanotubes? The nanotubes are relatively <coughs> easy to see a signal if you're using them as an acceptor with a polymer. And that's because you've separated your charges and they are now long lived. You've turned off recombination, which is the whole idea of doing it, of course. Once you've got the carrier on the, uh, the nanotube, we, we think we can work down at loadings of about one weight percent um, easily. Very easily, in fact. I'd say we go down by no tools and magnitude and still see something. This question, Justin, at the back. Hi, uh, so, with your microwave resonance, uh, do you get a bit of one microwave frequency? Because it does incredible conductance each 
Uh, change the frequency. There's two changing frequencies. Um, 10 to 10.01 is the sort of thing that we can do. Actually, we can go a bit further than that. So you can move around uh, a central frequency by a few megahertz. Okay? Uh, changing it to say uh, 30 gigahertz is means that you have to take the thing apart in order to do, use a different size waveguide. So if, if you've seen an EPR spectrometer, you'll see that there's waveguides in it, whether it's an X-band or a Q-band or a D-band EPR spectrometer. They need different size waveguides. And so we cannot move too far away from the, the waveguide dimensions that we use. So our samples are about, or our waveguides are about a centimetre by two centimetres. So that is around, that, our gun diode works. The microwave people say, gun diodes? No one uses gun diodes. We do, and we only have one left. And when it dies, we're in real, real trouble. <laughs> they don't make them anymore. So if anyone's got a 10 gigahertz gun diode sitting in their drawer, I'll take it. It's very hard. So you can't really chip, you can't, to answer your question as you asked it, uh, you can't move the frequency very, very far. We can move it within a, a, a small window. But it doesn't tell us any more information other than we pick up the resonance. Yeah, there's, there's a big jump there, but that, that's technically correct. And in fact, the terahertz is, is basically doing that. Right? The terahertz is jumping to you know, a factor of 100 higher in frequency than, than what we work at. That, that's, a, that's actually quite a complex question that you've asked. I'm sure the rest of the audience will be delighted that I'm not going to fully answer it. <laughs> and, and I'd like to tell you that on behalf of the chairman, we're not going to have another coffee break or tea break. <laughs> Beer, I think. Uh, right, I think that's um, uh, a good point to kind of leave it. Now, Sean has a few announcements to make. Um, we'll get to in a second. Before we do that, perhaps you join me in thanking Gary and all of the software.